There's just horrible destruction uh, after a weekend torrent of 27 tornadoes ripped through six states. Hardest hit was Kentucky, where it's not possible to search for victims door to door in some areas because there are no doors. Duck and cover. Those were the last words workers in a candle factory heard before it was raised to the ground. The governor said he was praying for a miracle. Well, today there's hope his prayer might be answered. Dale Hurd reports. Workers on the night shift at Mayfield Consumer Products were in the middle of the holiday rush, cranking out candles. When the word went out, duck and cover. Before and after photos show what happened next. It was first feared as many as 70 factory workers might be dead. But as of Monday morning, that number stands at eight dead, eight missing. I am uh, praying. Uh, that maybe uh, original estimates of those we've lost were wrong. If so, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty wonderful. Dozens of people in five states were killed by tornadoes that leveled entire communities Friday night, leaving many areas looking like war zones. At least four twisters hit Kentucky, including one with an extraordinarily long path of more than 200 miles, possibly the longest in U.S. history. Entire towns are devastated, with more than 1,000 homes damaged or destroyed across 10 counties. Governor Andy Bashir said going door to door in search of victims wasn't possible in the hardest hit areas because there are no doors. Before and after photos show the damage to the Amazon warehouse in Edwardsville, Illinois, where at least six people died after a tornado leveled half the building. Among the victims, Justice Verdon's dad, Larry Verdon. And I said, no, my dad, no, my dad's coming home. I said, I need my daddy. He can't leave. Her dad, an Amazon driver, was returning to the facility just as the tornado struck. In Mayfield Sunday morning, worshipers gathered amidst the rubble that used to house the first Christian church. This is a necessary gathering. The brick building that stood for generations was knocked down in a matter of minutes. I was born in this church. My three daughters were married in this church, <laughs> baptized in this church. It's, um, it's more than you can stand. We have to rely on our faith. And rely on one another. And rely on one another. And we will get through this. This town is small, but it's mighty. Governor Bashir expects the statewide death toll to reach at least 50, with at least 14 dead in Illinois, Tennessee, Arkansas, and Missouri. FEMA, the National Guard, and volunteers are pouring in to help with cleanup and rescue. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, the devastation is just uh, unimaginable. And CBN's Operation Blessing is already on its way to help victims of the disaster in Kentucky. Our hunger strike force is delivering a truckload of water and food and other disaster relief supplies to the town of Mayfield. That's going to happen today. Our U.S. disaster relief team is, is cooperating with Home Depot. We're creating disaster relief kits in our warehouse in Bristol, Tennessee for further distribution. Then we have a site team on its way. This is huge. It's, this is a all, all hands on deck situation. The people there need a lot of help. Can Operation Blessing do it all? No, but we can do our part. If you want to be a part of that, give us a call. Say, I want to contribute to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. You can write us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Just put uh, Disaster Relief Fund on the memo line of the check, or you can call us right now, 1-800-700-7000, or you can visit CBN.com. In other news, the COVID-19 vaccination deadlines for most active duty service members is now passed. So far, not a single religious exemption has been granted. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. The deadline for the U.S. Army is this week, December 15th. Deadlines for uh, the other branches, the armed forces, have already passed. However, some military personnel are still waiting for decisions on their request for religious exemptions. As CBN national security correspondent Caitlin Burke reports, a growing numbers say they're being robbed of their religious liberties. Service members waiting on their religious exemption requests remain in limbo. While accustomed to following orders, those speaking with me say their faith won't allow them to comply with this one. 
it goes against my bodily sovereignty um, as a Christian. I mean, God makes it very clear that for me, you know, th th this, this body that I'm given, this is my last bastion of freedom. At the request of counsel, this service member asked not to be identified. He told CBN News that he received other vaccines from the military without doing much research. That wasn't the case when it came to the COVID-19 shot. This is something that's supposed to be good for me, and yet I'm being punished if I do not take something that's good for me. When that was the case, when that was when that happened, I've been the question, why is this being forced so heavily on us? In his exemption request, he cites fetal cell lines used in the research and development phase of the mRNA vaccines and in the production of Johnson & Johnson's shot. If his request isn't granted, he says he'll take a discharge before going against his beliefs. First Liberty Institute is representing a group of 35 Navy SEALs seeking an exemption with similar concerns. Attorney Mike Berry argues it's unconstitutional for their requests to be denied. That's blatant discrimination. You can't treat religious beliefs less favorably than you treat uh, medical conditions or administrative exemptions. Uh, re religious freedom in our country uh, is protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution, and that doesn't change just because you serve in the military. The National Faith Advisory Board, a group of more than 1,700 religious leaders organized by former President Donald Trump, is urging the Secretary of Defense to grant these religious accommodations, writing, quote, religious freedom is enshrined in our Constitution and must always be protected. Pentagon spokesman John Kirby tells CBN News religious exemptions are rare. For example, none has been granted in either the Navy or Marines in almost a decade. It's not about liberties. Um, it's about uh, a military medical requirement to keep them safe, to keep their family safe, to keep their units safe. Um, and the secretary uh, continues to strongly believe that, that these, vac these vaccines are uh, the best way to do it with respect with respect to COVID. I heard back from a Navy spokesman who told me that there is no blanket policy about denying religious exemption requests. Each is considered on a case-by-case -case basis. There are, however, very strict guidelines that must be met, including a history of objecting to vaccination. Anyone who does object and refuses to comply with getting vaccinated, Christian or not, will be given a general discharge. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Thank you, Caitlin. Sticking with the response to COVID, the United Kingdom is taking action, quick action, to stop the spread of the Omicron variant. Prime Minister Boris Johnson announcing a push to make a booster available to everyone 18 and over by the end of the year. That's one month earlier, uh, ahead of the earlier target, rather. Long lines formed at vaccination centers across Britain early Monday morning. UK health authorities said Omicron cases are doubling every two to three days. Johnson & Johnson is a warning of a, a, quote, tidal wave of the variant, saying the two doses of the vaccine aren't enough to prevent it. Well, turning to the Middle East, where for the first time an Israeli prime minister is paying an official visit to the United Arab Emirates. As Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, the visit highlights how the Middle East has changed since the historic Abraham Accords. Less than two years ago, it would have been unthinkable for most for Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed to greet Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett in Abu Dhabi. Before he left for the UAE, Bennett explained the purpose of his visit. We're going to be discussing ways to further our cooperation in a number of fields, especially strengthening our economic and commercial ties. In just one year since normalizing our relationship, We've already seen the extraordinary potential of the Israel-UAE partnership, and this is just the beginning. The importance of the meeting is, is the meeting itself. The fact that they can uh, have a photo op, shake hands, talk about the peace, and for the whole world and the region to see that. Bennett's visit follows a blitz of Israeli diplomacy in light of the nuclear talks in Vienna to stop Iran's nuclear program. Last month, for the first time, Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz paid an official visit to one of the Arab nations in the Abraham Accords and signed a military memorandum of understanding with Morocco. Last week, Gantz met with U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin about the Iranian threat. The nuclear program is a means to Iran's hegemonic goals, imposing its radical ideology and threatening Israel's existence. I'm deeply concerned about the Iranian government's nuclear actions in recent months. 
both its continued provocations and its lack of constructive diplomatic engagement. The President has made clear that if diplomacy fails, we are prepared to turn to other options. What those options are remains to be seen, but Israel has made clear its military option is on the table to stop Iran's nuclear program. Bennett's visit to the UAE underscores how far the Abraham Accords have progressed and how both Israel and its Sunni Arab neighbors see Iran as an existential threat. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Gordon, it's like we're watching a reshaping of the Middle East. It is. It's a reshaping and a real realigning where Israel was once the enemy and now the nuclear ambitions of Iran and their provocations. I mean, let's, you know, the long list from drone strikes against the uh, refineries in Saudi Arabia to uh, Yemen being a proxy war, Hezbollah being a proxy war, uh, all their incursions into Iraq, uh, their support of Syria. Uh, they want to create a pathway all the way to Israel. And it's, it's a smart move on, on the part of the other Arab nations to say we need to form a coalition and Israel can actually be an ally in that. It, it's wonderful news. There's a curious verse in the book of Ezekiel about Israel being at peace with all its neighbors. A lot of people say, well, you know, what about peace, peace, and there is no peace. Uh, but there is that verse, and it's, it's a sign uh, when Israel gets to be at peace with all her neighbors. Uh, we can look forward to that, but at the same time, after that, there's a bit of trouble. Hope has finally come to Capitol Hill. A ministry is bridging the gap between the deep divisions in Washington their mission, to provide prayer and pastoral support to everyone holding office in our nation's capital. Abigail Robertson has the story. People often come to Washington, D.C., wanting something from lawmakers or to criticize them. At Hope to the Hill, however, the goal is to encourage, support, and minister to these powerful and stressed politicians. The, the whole idea is that we're focusing on their faith, their faith journey, how things are going for them in their lives. And they see that we're not asking questions about how they feel about this issue or that issue. The only thing Nathan Kistler and George Roller want from members of Congress is to build relationships and pray with them. And uh, so many members, when you go into their office, like George uh, just said, you, uh, you walk in, they say, well, what can I do for you today? And we say, we don't want anything from you. We just want to know how we can pray for you. And it is amazing to see members uh, have had anything from they kind of shrug a little bit to crying mm -hmm. because they've never had anybody come into their office and ask them. As a nonpartisan organization, Hope to the Hill steers clear of talking politics. Uh, but it is a divided moment in American history. And so there's a few things to me that are transcending beyond um, party lines, politics, all those things. And, and one of the most important ones is prayer. That approach has also helped them cross party lines to create prayer partners. We can circle that House chamber together, Republican and Democrat, and seek God's face in the midst of everything else that's going on. Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers tells CBN News she appreciates their ministry today more than ever before. To be reminded of the spiritual battle and the importance of prayer, the importance of reading the Word of God and putting on the armor of God and being more aware of what God might be doing in the course of a day or a conversation and bringing it back to His being His, his defender, His ambassador here on Capitol Hill day in and day out. Congressman Barry Loudermilk agrees. Even if it's just to come and pray for a few minutes, you know, to have someone there who is praying for you uh, and about the issues that you're facing, because a lot of members of Congress, the, the primary issues they're facing isn't what's happening to our country, which is stressful enough, but it's issues that they're facing with their families uh, from being separated. During his time in Congress, Loudermilk survived the congressional baseball shooting an assassination attempt and a nearly fatal car wreck. One thing that God has used in all of that is to teach me that we have to go through these times to become stronger warriors for Christ. Loudermilk believes God will bring America through these troubling times of deep political divisions. God isn't done with America yet. 
He has to take us to the edge of the abyss to see what will happen if we don't turn our eyes back on him and get our eyes back on our cause, and that cause is the cross. Hope to the Hill also trains lawmakers on how to share their faith with others. One of the members in that group that day told me the next day that he used what he had learned. He shared faith with another member of Congress, and that person prayed to receive Christ. George adds he once gave a Bible to a non-believer, and it sat unused on his desk for over a year. One day, he had a, a brief moment, which is rare for members of Congress. He actually had a few moments. He opened it. He was fascinated. He'd never read the Bible before. He began to read, and then he began to read more and more. Through that process, he came to faith in Christ. He, since then, after that, he went to Bible college in his city, and now he preaches on Sundays when he's at home, and he's still a very beloved member of of this uh, Congress, and he loves Jesus. George and Nathan also recommend believers call their representatives to offer encouragement. And just say, hey, I'm praying for you. God loves you, I love you, and we appreciate the work that you do, um, and build a relationship. It's likely to make their day, since most calls come from angry people. People can call and encourage and, and build relationship with people here. Because when the time comes when you have to have a difficult discussion about something that you may disagree with them on, they're going to want to hear what you have to say because you've actually showed that you care about them. George and Nathan see Washington, D.C. as one of the most valuable and fertile mission fields on the planet. They want to share the hope that no matter how divided things appear, God is raising up a mighty remnant of people in America's capital. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Well, every once in a while you read stories out of Congress and you just want to throw your hands up and say, let's, let's throw all the bums out. It would be much better to throw your hands up and pray and ask God to bless them and give them wisdom. This is why the Apostle Paul, I mean, he's talking about the Roman Empire, and he says, pray for those who are in leadership. Uh, pray for those who are in government. Uh, they actually have a very tough job. Let us pray for them, and let's pray for our nation in the middle of all of this. The threats that we're all facing, whether you're talking about Russia invading Ukraine or China developing new weapon systems and being very aggressive in Asia, uh, all the pandemic uh, around getting a nuclear weapon, these are all issues that we're all facing, and we need to come together and realize there is an answer. Let's pray to God. And let's get that answer, and let's get that answer today. Well, you can discover the history of Christmas and the meaning behind the holiday traditions through our new film, Christmas, the Story Behind the Traditions. You'll learn why December 25th is the historical birth date of Jesus, what's the symbolism behind Christmas trees, stockings, how the tradition of gift-giving began. And that's all yours for a gift of any dollar amount. The reason we're asking for funds for this is we're in production of a new uh, film called The Oracles of God to tell us how we got the Bible. So for a gift of any dollar amount, we'll send you a DVD copy of Christmas, the story behind the traditions, and then you'll get instant 4K streaming access through the CBN Family app. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000, or visit cbn.com slash traditions of Christmas to order a copy for yourself. It also makes a great Christmas gift, so do it now. Well, Angie Cross was having lunch with her family just days before Christmas. Suddenly, a sharp pain hit her. Next, she was convulsing with seizures and foaming at the mouth. And then, on her way to the ER, Angie stopped breathing and went into cardiac arrest. What happened next led hospital staff to call Angie the Christmas miracle. On December 14th, 2017, Angie was in the Christmas spirit and enjoying lunch with her family when she started to experience unbearable stomach pain. So she took some of the medicine her doctor had recently prescribed for the stomach ache, but she had an adverse reaction to it. And moments later, her husband Bill says things took a turn for the worse. We thought it'd just stop hurting. But it didn't. This was uh, some kind of reaction. You know, she just all of a sudden got real sick. At that time, my youngest son jumped up, ran around, grabbed her, put her in the car. We didn't get a block away, and she started having seizures and uh, foaming at the mouth. 
Then, Angie stopped breathing. Bill pulled over and their son performed CPR until the paramedics arrived. En route to the hospital, she went into cardiac arrest multiple times. I was, I was just dying. I, I couldn't imagine life without her. Angie's my soulmate, and uh, I, I don't know if I'd want to live without her. In the emergency room, chest compressions continued. Emergency department technician Eric Stokes was part of the team working to save her life. While we're doing compressions, we'll stop, and she'll start seizing. The whole time I'm pressing, I'm talking to God, like, God, please come on and just, just put your power through me right now. Help me to bring her back. Angie's heart stopped beating for up to 15 minutes several times. Meanwhile, friends and family began to gather and pray as Bill cried out to God on his wife's behalf. And I felt so helpless. And then I, I, and then I said, well, there, I can pray. And so I got on my knees. I felt like I was in God's presence. I was pleading her case, Lord, please, you know, spare her. She's a good person. She, she you know, our family needs her. And then I felt a, a rush of a surge of energy and, and, and I knew she was gonna be okay. Two and a half hours passed, then a glimpse of hope. Finally, Angie's pulse was steady, but doctors expected her to have severe brain damage and warned Bill she may never be the same. I just kept praising God. Praise you, Lord God, thank you. Praise God, you just keep praising God because you can't have any doubt. And Eric comes walking out. And he gave me a hug and he was like, hey, thank you. I said, well, don't thank me. I said, uh, thank God for what he's getting ready to do. Angie's loved ones continued to pray with anticipation. On day six, she was awakened from a medically induced coma and taken off the ventilator. Doctors were astonished. They asked me, um, can you move your feet? Can you move your hands? What's the date? Um, you know, who's the president? <laughs> asked a lot of questions. And then the neurologist asked me, he goes, um, what well, was December 7th, 1941? And I was thinking like, why is he asking me about Pearl Harbor? I said, it's Pearl Harbor, you know? And I asked him, I, I said, well, you know, if I knew you were gonna give me a history lesson, you know, I would have studied. We all got a little chuckle out of that. He gave me a thumbs up and um, he walked out. Medical staff called her the Christmas miracle. She continued recovery and Angie was released to go home on Christmas Eve, only 11 days after her brush with death. She had no long-term health issues. In fact, she says she feels better than before. I thank the Lord for giving me a second chance. This is a second chance. Um, when you go without a heartbeat for so long, there's a, thousands of bad things that could happen, and they didn't happen to me. And I just want to give the glory to God. I want people to know that in your worst situation, the worst scenario ever, you can pray. You can pray, that's what saved me. One of the other prayers I prayed when I was in the hospital room said, Lord, please just let us walk in the pasture. Let us hold hands in the pasture again. And when we came home from the hospital, that's one of the first things we did was we drove up to our pasture and we walked in it and we held hands in the sunshine and we just thanked God for that moment because life is a vapor. It's gone so fast. We need to do what we can and love our family and live life while we have a chance. This Christmas, Angie and Bill celebrate the joy of family, friends who have become like family, the blessing of prayer, and the gift of hope. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord is doing miracles. He's helping us every day. Life is a vapor, and sometimes it's not until something happens, like what happened to Angie, that you realize just how precious it is and how quickly it can be taken away from you. You know, there are many of you today I know who are longing for prayer, who many of you who tune into this program specifically for this time for prayer. And we want to say that we recognize the importance of prayer. You know, sometimes we say in, in difficult situ situations, well, all I could do was pray, when really prayer is the thing that moves all of heaven on our behalf. And so we want to pray for you today. Uh, we have sent, many of you have gotten this in the mail, the, the little um, ornaments, one for your tree and one to send in your prayer request to us. And so this week, we're going to be praying for you as we read some of these that have come in. This is someone saying, please pray for healing of severe pain in my hips and legs, causing me to fall. Someone else saying my immune system would be restored after a leukemia flare. And then strength and comfort for my family. My father passed away on Thanksgiving Day. Gordon. Mm -hmm. 
This one to be healed of neuropathy, mm -hmm. for my child to grow up in self-respect and to stand up against bullies. And then for my mother, who's in hospice, to accept Jesus. Let's pray for these. Let's pray for you and, and realize that today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, it seems uh, like we're getting more of this pandemic. It seems like there are catastrophes happening all around the world. A lot of trouble. Let's go to the Lord in prayer with all of it. When we see these things, let's look to him, for he is the answer to every human need. Lord, we come to you, and, and we just say, we don't have the answer, but we have you, and you have the answer. You have all that we need. So we come to you as little children, asking. We ask for these prayer requests that we read. We ask for every prayer request on the tree on the set. We ask for every prayer request that's been mailed in, for all of them that have been phoned in. We ask for them all. For we know that you are God Almighty. With you, all things are possible. So stretch forth your hand to do miracles. And Lord, give us the greatest miracle, and that is you, your presence. For when you are Emmanuel, when you are God with us, we fear no evil, for you are with us. Your righteous right hand upholds us. Manifest your presence in our hearts, in our spirits, in our minds, in the atmosphere all around us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Terry Gunn's giving you something. Yeah, there's someone, you have an issue um, with your property, and it's a legal matter, but the issue for you really is the anxiety that this has provoked in your mind and in your spirit and your body. God is inviting you to a place of peace in Him. Let that go. Put it up on the altar before Him. Let it go and begin to lift your hands and praise Him, and His peace will come upon you in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone you've got um, severe coughing and, and you're worried about COVID, you're worried about uh, some lung infection. Worry no more. God is touching you right now and all of that coughing is leaving you now. Your lungs are clear. Just take a deep breath. God's healing all of that for you right now in Jesus' name. Now, someone else, you have mental confusion, and it's also frightening you because it's not something you normally have. God is healing that for you right now. Just begin to worship Him and thank Him for it. Uh, there's someone, you've had a headache for several days, and it's just uh, just sort of lingering, and, and, and finally it's kind of breaking through that could there be something wrong? And, and God's heard your prayer. He's concerned about everything concerning you, and so He's healing you right now. He's restoring it. That pain's leaving. All of that confusion is leaving too, in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are God with us. We thank you that you came to us. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made, for you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son. We thank you for it, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Let us share your good report. And if you want to be part of our uh, prayers on set, all you have to do is mail in these uh, wonderful ornaments. We've got one that you can mail to us and one you can put on your own tree. If you don't have them, you can always call us, 1-800-700-7000. We'd be glad to include you, you in the prayers. So it's our honor, our privilege to pray for you. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. The Miss Universe pageant crowned its 2021 winner in Ilat, Israel last night. Anaz Sundu of India topped about 80 contestants to win the crown on the pageant's 70th anniversary. Sundu said she felt overwhelmed by the victory. The pageant went forward despite some protests in the coronavirus. A Palestinian-led boycott urged contestants to skip the event with little success. And though the Omicron variant showed up in Israel, only one contestant, Miss France, tested positive. She recovered in time to rejoin the competition. Well, the Canadian version of the 700 Club is reaching more and more people daily on national TV and digital media with a mix of ministry, interviews and testimonies. 
With an expanded effort on social media, the 700 Club Canada is also now reaching new audiences with timely issues and messages of hope. In recent months, the program's YouTube channel has grown by an average of more than 3,000 new monthly subscribers and in October recorded 1 million video views. Linda, a viewer from British Columbia, wrote, I just want to say thank you for your wonderful broadcast, your hosts, your guests, and all the brave ones who tell the stories of pain and victory. What a great gift and message bearer you all are to this hurting world that desperately needs God's healing and hope. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to CBN.com slash international. Broken bones, it hurts to set them. But if you don't, they never really heal. Just ask Penny Maxwell. For years, she lived with the sharp pain of emotional broken bones, but not anymore. Penny Maxwell is an author and co-pastor of the thriving multi-site church, Freedom House, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Growing up, Penny learned how to survive through the most devastating circumstances. Her parents had eight marriages between them, and she was molested by her grandfather for years. In her book, Setting Broken Bones, Penny shares the difficult truths she's learned through healing and challenges you to trust God with your wounds. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Penny Maxwell. Penny, it's great to have you with us. Oh, beautiful, Terry. It is so great to be with you today. My honor, my honor. Well, I want you to talk a little bit, if you will, about your childhood. You endured physical, emotional, and sexual abuse growing up. How did you survive all that trauma? Well, you know, it's interesting. I get that question a lot. And one of the things that is so amazing to me is I remember always going, I don't understand why this is happening to me. It doesn't seem like it's fair. Um, I remember going, why am I born into this family? This isn't right. But interesting enough, I never blamed God. And I think that's why I was able to pull through some of the things that happened because I never took on the victim mentality. And I think that's really important, especially in our society right now, the way things are going. I think the victim mentality is a really big thing. I do too. When you were growing up and being sexually abused by your grandfather, um, of course, that's a difficult thing to tell someone in your family about. Finally, you, you had the courage to go to your family and say what was being done. Talk about what happened at that point. Yeah, well, I never came forward because I thought it was just me and my family was very dysfunctional, which is why my grandfather was allowed to continue to do what he was doing. There was no one that was covering me or looking out for me. So I never went forward, first of all, because I didn't think anybody would believe me. And I knew that they would probably care, but I just didn't know if anybody was going to do anything about it. But I actually went forward when I found out there were other people. That gave me the courage to say, you know, and it was sad because as a little girl, I didn't think it was just me worth what happened to me to go forward. I found out that there was other people as well. And that kind of, that sparked something in me that said, no more, this isn't okay. I'm going to put an end to this. And that's when the police got involved. And through all of that, you now say that the most crippling abuse, abuse you suffered wasn't the sexual abuse. What was it? Well, I knew uh, what was going to happen when I was around my grandfather. And the sexual abuse happened, and it happened often. But this is the thing I don't think most people understand. The most crippling abuse that I faced was the emotional and physical abuse that was suffered at the hands of my mother. And the reason is, is because she had such a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde personality that I didn't know if I was going to wake up being the golden child that day or if I was going to get um, abused because my comforter on my bed wasn't put on just rightly and my pillows weren't fluffed the way that they needed to be. And so living under that, I remember just times afraid to come out of my room wondering, you know, is this going to be a good day or is this going to be a bad day? What's going to happen? And when when you grow up like that, there's this evil foreboding that can happen in you. The Bible talks about it. It talks about, you know, living life, waiting for the other shoe to drop. And I think many of us, because of things that we have walked through, 
We are living our lives waiting for the other shoe to drop because of something that we have experienced or gone through. We're just basically waiting for God to show us what bad's going to happen today. And without intending to, we, we kind of place that on God. What was the only place you felt safe? Um, you know, I loved going to church as a little kid. Um, that was one thing that my parents did let me do. I remember as a four-year-old, the the school bus or the church bus coming around through our apartment complex, and I remember getting on that little church bus and going to church by myself. And I remember just feeling safe at church, but there wasn't much else. There was always this lingering feeling of not feeling safe. And so even as an adult, I realized that was something that I had to face, that it wasn't something that was going to go away until I flat out addressed it. And it carried over into other relationships. And I had to make a point to arrest that behavior and say, you know, this isn't, this can't continue. So how was the brokenness of all of these things from your past finally healed? Well, I remember um, just having a conversation with God and him just saying, listen, Pandora's box, you're going to need to go there. Because I think so many times we don't want to go there because we're afraid if we touch that area from our past you know, Pandora's box, you don't know what you're going to get when you open it. And so I was afraid to face what I needed to face in order to get the healing that I truly needed because I thought, well, what if I sink into a major pit here? What if, what if I can't control what comes out? And honestly, I couldn't because it wasn't about me in that moment trying to control things. It was about me saying, God, I surrender this. I give this to you. I no longer am going to walk around um, on a broken leg that I've got to allow you to come in and to re-break things that healed improperly. You see, the problem, Terry, is that all of us go through breaks in life, but most of us don't choose to heal because we've gone through breaks accidentally. But when we have to choose and say, God, I want you to heal me, then he has to intentionally break us. And we don't like the pain of that. So we would rather go around limping through life than say, God, I know this bone healed improperly. And the only way to fix it is to re-break it. So we anticipate pain. And because of that, we, we won't allow God to touch those areas of our life that he really needs to touch and reset. You and your husband, when you first met, had both come from broken backgrounds. You know, with the, the family right. records that you had, the likelihood of your staying together was pretty slim. And yet you both yeah. came to this realization that you needed to kind of get your act together before the Lord in order for things to succeed. How did you do that? You know, you're, you're right. Statistically, the two of us, um, it, we shouldn't have made it. We've been married almost 30 years. Um, we have three children, two are grown and married, and our youngest will probably soon be in that category. But yeah, you're right. The statistics were against us. But both of us, I mean, his mother was my husband's mother. I know she's watching right now. She was a drug dealer. And both of our dads died of alcoholism, our, our biological fathers. And so statistically saying we shouldn't have made it, especially watching the marriages that we had as examples. But there's something about when you hand your brokenness over to the Lord and you realize that you're not strong enough, you're not good enough. So we gave things over to the Lord, but more than just saying we gave it to God, you know, the cliche, we got into counseling and my husband, you know, we grew up in a church, unfortunately, that uh, wasn't real big on counseling. You just need God. That's all you need. And we knew that never settled well with us. It never felt right to us. So we ended up, we got into counseling and I had to convince my husband to go initially. Now he's all about it. But in the beginning, I had to say, babe, it's like a coach. You know, I couldn't use the word counselor because that seemed weak, but I used the word coach. Can we go get a coach? Because, you know, that sounds manly to a guy and it was more acceptable. So we started allowing those areas of our life to, to be touched and allow God to say, hey, you know what? This isn't okay. Ways that we would respond that were from our families of origin that weren't proper in a marriage. We had to, 
to reframe those areas and, and really learn how to communicate. We had to start all over again. And that was just something, we got married young. Um, I just turned 50 this year. So I got married when I was 20. And the good thing about that is that we got to grow and learn together. And both of us had some breaks in our life and we had to just lay on the operating table, but more important, stay on the operating table, not get off when it got painful. Boy, you did. And the story is in your book, Setting Broken Bones, along with what God has done in the lives of two people who were willing to let him get into those difficult places and mend the broken bones they had. Thank you so much. Great to have you with oh, us today. Honor. I want to mention the books available wherever books are sold. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Flood waters were rising fast, so nine-year-old Brittany lifted her two younger sisters onto a bed. All three were screaming by the time their mother reached them. Within minutes, this family lost everything but their lives. Nine-year-old Brittany, her mom, and two younger sisters were forced to find a new place to live after flash floods swept through their home. I was working when the storm hit. I ran through the flood waters. I heard my daughter screaming. I remember the water came into our house. I was very scared. I put my sisters on the bed. I was afraid they would drown. They were crying and the water kept rising. When mom got there, she grabbed us and carried us out. Liliana and her children lost everything in the flood and couldn't afford another place to live. So they moved to the roof of a friend's house where Liliana built a temporary shelter. A ladder was their only way up and down. I climbed first, then I helped my sister. Then we both helped mom with the baby. I'm scared that they will fall. I know my daughters do not like it up here. When Operation Blessing learned about the shelter on the roof, we decided to build a house for them. The workers then began to deliver building materials. That's when I realized it was true. We would have a house. A few weeks later, the family moved in. Our house is big, and there is enough room for me and my daughters. It is beautiful. We also told the family about Jesus, and they prayed to become Christians. I told Jesus I receive you in my heart, and from this day on, I will live for you. It is a new start for us now that we have Jesus. I felt peace and happiness inside. I told Jesus, thank you for hearing my prayers. To everyone who helped us, I pray that God will multiply his blessing on you four times over what you did for me and my daughters. And I want to thank all the donors who helped to build my house. Thank you. And that thank you goes to you. If you're a member of the 700 Club, we want to be there for people in their time of need and it's wonderful when we all join together that we can do just that. When tens of thousands of people say, yes, I want to be a help, then you can get the teams, you can have long-going support for people who want to give their lives to help others. If you want to be a part of it, just give us a call and say, yes, you can count on me. 1-800-700-7000. How much is it to join? Well, it's just $20 a month. That's 65 cents a day. Some can give more, so we have a lot of different club levels. If you'd like to do that, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000, or you can go to CBN.com. I think we have some time for some questions. Do. This is a viewer who says, I really appreciate CBN and the 700 Club. I have a question for Gordon. Recently, you said that some people may need to forgive God. I believe I understand what you mean by that, but it just doesn't seem right to even suggest that God would need to be forgiven for anything. Could you clarify what you mean by that? Well, I'll go back to the, the book of Job, and, and Job's wife encouraged him to curse God and die. Uh, and, and blame God for all the horrible things that had happened to him. Um, you know, just our guest today, when, when, you're, when you're a child and you're suffering with sexual abuse, you're suffering with emotional abuse, physical abuse, uh, a lot of people ask the question, God, why do you let this happen to me? How did this happen? You get a, you get a bad diagnosis. You lose a child, uh, a child dies. 
you, you come to God, well, you know, why uh, is, is one question. But some people actually blame him uh, and say, well, God caused this to be. He, if he's sovereign, well, then he caused this to be. And in your theology, you need to say, well, time and chance happen to us all. And there is evil. Why did God allow evil in his universe is an open question. Uh, a lot of theologians debate that a long time. But when it comes to you and your relationship with God, if you need to forgive him, please do. Uh, our guest today said, I never blame God. And it was a key for me to getting through it. Because in blaming him, he's now the cause and I reject him instead of looking at him as the solution. When a man was born blind and the disciples brought him to Jesus, they had the theological question, why did God cause this? And they based it on sin. Who sinned? Did he sin? And, you know, how's that fair? Because he hasn't sinned yet. Or did his parents sin? And how is that fair to him? Because he's bearing the brunt. He's bearing the punishment for their sin. I love what Jesus said. Neither. This happened that the glory of the Lord would be revealed. If you have things in your heart where you're wondering, God, where were you? Or why did you let this happen? All of these things, please remove them and get to that point. This happened that the glory of the Lord could be revealed and could be revealed through me. Here's a verse of comfort for you from Psalm 34. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. For Terry, for me, for all of us, Merry Christmas to you. We'll see you again tomorrow.